our first two lectures already. Let me just take this up a bit. So we had uh, my introductory lesson and specifically we talked about brands as publishers. There's an article that I want you to read um, on that. I just want to see where I have it. Um, I'll send you a link, an additional link for that article. I know you're supposed to read scholarly articles. <laughs> I will make sure we read scholarly articles as well. But um, they're not always right on the cusp of the beat of life. That's true. Yeah, that's but don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll send you scholarly articles as well. Hey? <laughs> okay, so that was the first lesson and then we briefly talked about the marketing team. Tonight we're going to do Introduction to Marketing Concept and I've got a whole list of additional sources there for you that we'll talk about and then I'll send you the information afterwards. Next week we're doing Understanding the Market. Um, so that is chapters 2 to 3 and we're looking at marketing research, segmentation, competition and generational theory. And then after that you have an assignment for the following week. Okay. So that assignment is this one, it's where you're actually going to take one of the generations that we discuss in class, give a detailed description of generational theory in each of the following, so we're going to look at veterans, baby boomers, generation X, generation Y, generation Z and generation alpha. Sorry, yes. can we get a copy of it? Yes, 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 I'll email it to you, I'm just going through it so that you are aware. Pick one of these generations and discuss uh, in how marketing and sales of content is impacted by this generation. And how would you approach marketing of content and sales to this generation? Highlight with at least one innovative example or idea. So you go and ha you have to pick one of these generations, research them properly, then give talk to me about how you would market to that specific generation. Okay, so that's easy one. For the MA students, I might add number of words or add an additional question. Sorry, you wanted to jump the gun here. Right, then, yes. So that assignment is due the 13th of August. So you have a week for that one. Okay. And you'll email it to you. Yes, I'll email it to you. I'll email it tomorrow morning. I just want to go through it so that you know. 13th of August, we discuss marketing content as an education publisher. 20th of August, marketing content as a tertiary publisher. And the 27th of August, we discuss marketing content as a trade publisher. Then you have a week's study break, um, actually almost two weeks, and you have another assignment there. Okay, so you have an assignment in the study break. Um, pick one of the publishing industries in South Africa and critically evaluate current marketing and sales techniques. You may want to identify one specific publishing company in the industry you choose. Your critical review should highlight what is working and why, what is not working and why. Benchmark the activity with international trends and identify the opportunities. End with your recommendations. So it can be as scholarly as you like, but I want to hear you. I want to hear your thoughts. I know you aren't supposed to write in the first person. <laughs> I don't mind you writing in the first person. Okay. Um, then, after the break, we've got a study break, we do marketing tools. Sorry, so that one is due on the... Uh, so that one is due when you come back on the 10th of September. So I give you a nice two weeks for that one. Okay. And you've got a little study break. And then on the 10th of September, we do marketing tools. <coughs> the 17th of September, we do, uh, we start with digital marketing. Oh, sorry, we do direct marketing. That almost looked the same. And for direct marketing, you've got another assignment that's author related. Okay. And that one's due the... And that one is also due a week later. But you've got Heritage Day on the 24th, so it's almost two weeks to do that one. So the 1st of October? 1st of October. I'll put the, 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 the due dates in as well. Okay. So the one on the authors is take your favorite author and research what and how they contribute to their brand and the subsequent marketing and sales of their content. Include as many features of their contribution 
this regard as possible. For example, PR, social media, websites, events, etc. Yes. They have to be alive. Hey? They have to be alive. They don't have to be alive. If you can find enough stuff, if they're dead and still doing this, that's a very small publisher. <laughs> if they're dead and still selling books by doing that, you go, girl. <laughs> So they don't have to be alive. If I mean, obviously they won't be doing events, but um, <laughs> they might have. They might be featured at Comic Con. I don't know. Yeah. So, um, so they don't, ha they don't have to be alive. But I mean, they have to have enough of a presence as an author. Okay. So that one is due the first of October. And then we have our two um, digital marketing uh, uh, le lectures. Fifteenth of October, we have writing a marketing plan. And that's when I give you your final assignment. Okay. And the final assignment, I'm afraid I'm not going to let you choose a company because there are a lot of smaller companies that could benefit from this. So um, I'm going to select a number of companies. I'm going to have a Christopher's hat in class and you're going to draw a publisher. Okay. And then you're going to have to do your assignment on that publisher. Um, we're not doing a marketing plan for one specific title, we're doing a marketing plan for a publishing list, so it's quite big. Alright, <coughs> when will that one be? Due? So that one is then probably due, I just want to see here the dates. So they have to be in, I'll give you more time, I'll probably give you this actually after the holidays already so that you can start looking at it. So I'll make sure to give it to you by the 1st of September. So that when you have to hand in the 29th of October, you've had almost two months to do it. Okay. Is that fair? That's fair. <coughs> All right. Cool beans. Is everybody happy with that? I'm sorry it's so much work. I could have you work in pairs, but... I, I, just, just, I just wonder about the third assignment, the 5,000 word count. Yes. It's nice, eh? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot you can write about an author. Okay, so can... You can include images to make it eight pages. <laughs> <laughs> Print screen the website for me. <laughs> so like 500 words counts as one image? Yeah, five... <laughs> no. Half a page. Just a picture. I can promise you the moment you start writing... Oh, that's two five pages. <laughs> five pictures. Just start writing, it's just going to come out of your own Okay. <laughs> Who enjoys writing assignments? Oh, come on! It's nice. <laughs> For those of you who are doing your masters, you have to hand in a dissertation. So this is an excellent, <laughs> an excellent start. Good practice. Good practice. Okay, so everybody happy with that? So that's an overview of assignments. And I will email this to everybody. Um, so it's three mini assignments and then your final one. Okay, only the final one has to be printed and handed in. The others you can just email to me. All right. Great. Now I actually want to, because we're going to work out of the textbook, I wanted to show you the websites, but I can't see my computer. How do I get this back? Let's see. This is a function F7. This one? Mm -hmm. No, so I have no idea. It's a laptop. Let's <laughs> try it's, it's HP, isn't it? As digital as I am, just don't ask me. Someone asked me, do you have a LAN connection? I said, what?
one. I got two this time. Way. with government 
Um, they'd focus mainly on kind of STEM subjects um, and of course English. Gotcha. Yeah. So do you disagree with them? I don't disagree with them. The problem is we haven't figured out in South Africa how to make this coexist with other types of publishing and whether other types of publishing should still exist. I mean, that's a reality. Um, you know, innovation is the downfall of many, many an industry and many business models. Um, so I don't disagree with them. They have, in the years past, really perfected the way in which they create content. They were one of the first people, I'll ask you now, one of the first p uh, companies who had a online authoring tool for their authors. So authors collaborate online to write content which was quite innovative at the time, um, which is something when we're not sure whether the Mixit team stole from Siavula or Siavula got the idea from Mixit because Mixit was also about the online co-authoring. Remember Mixit was a chat mm -hmm. and then Mixit later became a publishing platform. They did maths in English. I don't even know if they exist anymore. I don't think they exist at all anymore. So I can't say that I disagree with them. Gotcha. They have come a long way. Yeah. Yes. Online and print based. Okay. Yeah. Because I was going to say, if they're just online, it's very difficult to get very, very difficult. accessibility throughout the country yeah. where people don't have easy connections. Yeah. So there you see, Mix It is still access to free education, health and counseling services. Those work continues to the Reach Trust. Mix It is not what Mix It was. Yes. do so have to get permissions and that's why content is so expensive. What do we have um, which is the, 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 the opposite argument for getting permissions? Creative Commons. Yes. Sorry, what, what is Creative it? Commons. So Creative Commons license, I can't remember who started it. Um, as an author, you can tell a publisher my work is available as, as a Creative Commons license and there are different types of licenses under Creative Commons. And then your stuff is shareable. Um, the sad thing is, is that most of the content that publishers use, for example, if you do, if you want to, in English textbook, have um, a cartoon from Zapiro, Zapiro doesn't do Creative Commons because um, he makes a hell of a lot of money out of his cartoons. If you do um, a table in an economics textbook with statistics in, it's probably from the Financial Times and they ask a hell of a lot of fees as well. So publishers have to rethink where they get their content because we, want, we use trusted sources to create <coughs> trusted content, but those trusted sources come with a high, high fee. Um, and that is why books are still expensive. What Siavula have done is they've literally went and created content that does not reference other content at all. They wrote from scratch. And the agreements that they went into with the subject matter experts was that those people will be their partners and not their authors. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that a lot of the Siavula authors are shareholders in the business. Mm -hmm. That's another business model to consider. Or they pay them a fee, a once-off um, commissioning fee, so I commission content from you. Once I commission it and I pay you your fee, we own that content. Publishers have tried to move to that and move away from royalties. And the authors, obviously, if, I mean, if you're an author who has been receiving good royalties for seven years, why would you want to suddenly get a once-off fee for that same amount of work? <coughs> So publishers have found it extremely difficult to move to that. Okay, so in terms of marketing, the ambivalence lies in two things. We are never sure, we are creating what we call in South Africa, um, um, I almost want to say the knowledge economy, indigenous knowledge. We're creating indigenous knowledge through works that we publish. And there's an indigenous knowledge act, okay, 
the, the creative industries have never subscribed to that act, it, uh, not book publishing at least. But people consider us in the creative industry, even though we're in the maps, in the, in the CETA where plastics are made. Um, so we create these cultural artifacts, but we ask a price for them because we make profit. So there's always that ambivalence. On the other side, there's great ambivalence for marketing because we don't know to what extent do we push the brand, do we push the author, do we push the publishing philosophy, do we push the publishing list. In some countries, they push the, the publisher themselves as a person. Some publishers are quite famous for publishing certain types of books and people will follow that publisher. Um, to give you an example of where those lines are blurring, if you think about Reese Witherspoon's book club, it's huge. Yes, she was a celebrity, but she's now at a point where she is a commissioning editor for, I think it's Harper Collins. So where people say, but she's so good at selecting stuff people want to read. So she and uh, Nicole Kidman did um, uh, Little, Little Lies, Big Little, Big Little Lies from Leanne Moriarty. That was one of the books they read and the fact that they were able to identify something that's become pop culture is very good. The other one is, um, who plays Carrie Bradshaw? Yes, she's also recently become an er editor um, for a publishing house. Um, just want to see if I can find the article. So this was as recent as this year. So she started her own book imprint with HBO. And I was at HBO. Let's just see. No, HBO was the series. Oh, well, then the second paragraph. Yeah. SJP for Hogarth. Okay. Okay. SJP is, I mean, her initials are famous. Okay. So we're seeing the lines blur and people, are, people follow her voice. So you can market SJP titles, but you are marketing SJP's title. Okay. So that's quite important. Um, and then, very, very important, um, it is a frequent comment that today's publishing industry is driven by marketing. Decisions about what to publish and the quality of content are subsumed into overriding concerns about whether or not material will sell. So we constantly have this thing in publishing. Do we create um, content that we think will sell or do we see what the market wants and we create that content? Do we anticipate the, the zeitgeist of the time and we publish content in context with that? Or do we say, this is clearly a trend, we'll publish content in that? So who makes the decision, the readers or the publisher? Years ago, it was definitely the publishers. The publishers had a very specific voice and they published just that. Um, if you can look at someone like Chikana Media in South Africa, they still have a very specific voice. But they are trying to understand what the market wants in terms of that voice and interpret that for a publishing list. Okay, so that's very important. Um, now, the, there are a couple of things they say there, things to highlight for marketing. The first thing is the publishing industry is a business and if it is to survive, it must either make a profit or find funding elsewhere. What kind of funding models do you think exists for publishers? <laughs> Who can fund publishing? Sponsors. Sponsors, advertisers. Crowdfunding is a nice one now, we've never had that before. Self-publishing is a form of sponsorship, so we're seeing a rise in the what we call a co-publishing model, whereas previously co-publishing was between two publishing houses, co-publishing can now mean between a publishing house and an author. So the author fronts some of the funds to make the book available, and the publisher fronts some of the funds. So there are different, different funding models. Let me just quickly plug this in. Okay. Very, very important for us to make a profit. Do you guys remember the five R's for publishing? 
the right this, the right that. The five R's. Yes. Because that is what determines profit for us. And everybody went blank. Where did you say that? Because there are five R's for R's for publishing, and there are seven R's for marketing. R's. Now wait, now, now wait, wait, wait. It's nice that you're jumping to page nine. The two, four, six, seven R's on page nine is the R's for marketing. What are the R's for publishing? The right content to the right audience at the right time through the right channel in the right format. It's like a little poem. Okay. Uh, I want to show you an article and you can write down the details. So I opened them up all on my phone last night. Um, then uh, the four R's. R's. When I, when I finish this class, I'm going to wake you up in the middle of the night and say, what are the five R's of publishing? And then you will remember, hey. So in digital marketing, because remember, that's, digital marketing is all about content, they talk about the four R's, right content at the right time to the right person through the right channel, in publishing, we add an additional one to say the right format. Okay, because there's a lot of formatting work that goes what into is what... Order? Hey? What is the order? Oh, you can say the right content to the right audience at the right time, mm -hmm. through the right channel, in the right format. Those are the five R's of publishing. The R. Mm -hmm. Not reading and writing in the arithmetic, <laughs> but the right content. The right time, the right audience, the right time. Everything. everything. It's everything right. <laughs> okay, do everything right, yes. Okay, so that is extremely, extremely important. Those other ones on page 9 are the R's for marketing, and we'll look at them a little bit later. All right. Then on page 4, um, Alison Braverstock tells us, Books or any published content compete for spending power against a whole range of products, not just other books. In our first lecture, we talked about who are we competing with as publishers. And then we said any other form of entertainment or education or information search, it depends on what is the job to be done. Okay. So keep that in mind, we are competing. So when you look at, when you do market research and when you look at competing products, titles, content, very often publishers look at mainstream publishers as their direct, con their direct competitors. That's fine, they can be your direct competitors. But there are also indirect competitors. Michael Porter, make a little, little knopiki in your heads, uh, Michael Porter has the five forces model. Who's heard of that? I'm sure you have also. Yes, and you, obviously. What can you tell us about the five forces model? <laughs> I want to see if it's a nice image. Okay. Um, I might even ask you in your final assignment to do a bit of Michael Porter's five forces. Yeah, that's, it's very, very nice. So what Michael Porter says, that for anybody to compete in any market, okay, um, when you do an analysis of the competing in environment and how competitive it is, you look at new entrants into the market. Now, if you think about publishing, new entrants into the market for us, and I must say, or most of this is very much technology related. 
So if we said, remember that first slide I had on in, less, in the first lecture where we said, why is it so easy for us to compete at a content level? And we said um, the, the, the barriers to entry are less, the, it's easier for people to search, and it's easier for people to group themselves together according to their peers. So that, those, those three factors make it so much easier for people to become new, new threats, new competition for us in publishing. The second one is the bargaining power of buyers. So our buyers have greater bargaining power now because they've got more options. Okay. Technology is part of that, but innovative business models have also brought along greater opportunities for people to shop okay, and to buy stuff. The threat of substitute products or services, very much like new entrants. If I want to read about fly fishing, do I buy a book or do I go onto a blog? Okay. And the last one is the bargaining power of suppliers. Think about our authors. Okay? So that whole value chain, our entire value chain is basically being broken down because anybody could go directly to the market. The wholesaler can go directly. The bookshop can go directly without the wholesaler. The author can go directly. The publisher can go directly. So the bargaining power of the suppliers is actually increased um, in a competitive environment. Okay, so if you want some additional reading, read up about Michael Porter's Fire Forces model. I might reference it again later, but it's not that important now, but it's nice to know. The thing we have to ask ourselves is, why do people buy? Why do we buy stuff? For status. For? Status. For status, that's a good one. Because we need it. Okay. So a status is that a nice to have or a must have? Mm, I don't know. It's like in like the in between space. Yeah. Because status, I mean, it's not a. It's not, it's, I mean, we all buy things for status. But status, I suppose, is we buy things that are nice to have. Yeah. Whereas if we buy toilet paper, we need to have. Whereas if you buy a Rolex, it's nice to have it. You could buy a Casio. Okay? Why do you, why do you purchase stuff? Think about a, re a recent purchasing decision that you made. What was your process of making that purchasing decision? How did you go about buying that product? Okay? It was pretty. It was pretty, so you are visually inclined. Okay? Anybody else? I needed it. I needed it. You needed it, so you pr you're probably um, uh, audio digital, so you thought about it a lot. I'm doing some neuro linguistic programming on you, so you thought about it. You thought, I need this. Okay? Anybody else? Some people buy it because they can afford it. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> if you can afford it, yeah. But how did you come to a decision to say, right, I'm actually going to put my money down or do an EFT or click checkout. I think you convince yourself that you need it. Yes. Yeah, I will feel more and I'm not going to buy it. But actually, yeah. I feel, yeah. I mean, yeah. if you feel like need it, need it, there will yeah. that, that be a, a thought process, mm -hmm. but if you don't actually need it, you don't. So let's, let's think, um, I want all of you to think about a really expensive item you recently bought. You don't have to tell me, just think about it. What was the first thing you did to say to yourself, I want to, I need to, I have to purchase that item? What was the first thing you did? I looked at its functionality and how it would fit in my life. Okay, so you looked at functionality. Yeah. Tried it on. Yeah. Tried it on. Worked on how much money I had left after I bought it. Yes. <laughs> Very much thinking. Yeah. yeah. Did you look at the actual item? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And okay. then you had a desire yeah. for it. Ooh, I'm okay. Kill game with <laughs> <laughs> and you visualized yourself with that item. Yes. Who, who, for who is visualizing important? Who thought about what other people would say when they have Definitely. that item? <laughs> Audio. <laughs> okay. Um, who thought about the budget? Yeah. That's one of the ones. <laughs> 
thinker. Um, all right, the point I'm trying to make is, in purchasing is very much a science, okay? We do it on a daily basis. We go into checkers and we buy milk and bread. But even in that moment that we're standing in front of that, of that milk uh, rack at the, at the fridge, we're kind of deciding, is a price, is it the right price, the right product? Have they promoted it to me correctly in the right way, at the right time, in the right place? Now, right time, the right place is interesting because it, we have to be in the moment I need milk. But let's say there was clover at 24 rand and checkers milk at 19 rand. What would you buy automatically? A checkers. I think, it, but it also depends on if I'm looking at the shelves and I see that the, the milk that's 19 rand is expiring next week, but the other one is expiring in two weeks, then I'd get that one Think because up. I don't use as much milk as somebody okay. else might. That's right. So let's say they said um, 19 rand 99 today because it expires tomorrow. Okay, it's in how they promote it, but we all make a psychological decision every time we purchase something. It is driven by need, it is driven by want, it is driven by desire. There's a very nice video on the neuro-linguistic process, NLP programming, for our purchasing decisions. I'll see if I can find it and then I'll send it on to you. But look at that, you'll be shocked yourself at how all of us, irrespective of our differences, follow the same method for purchasing items. Okay, nice thing to keep in mind for books, because books is not something we, it's different to buy a book than to buy a milk. Hey. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Um, okay, hey? You know, for the Star Courses, um, the sixth one, so they're trying to add the sixth one of complementary products? Oh, really? I didn't know. No, that's good. <laughs> I did I did Michael Porter like 15 years ago. But that's that's good that you mentioned. There's another one that we also look at later, Ansoff, who's done Ansoff Matrix. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. You'll enjoy it. Okay. Right. Now the second thing there is that how many books do you think are published annually in the world? Um, <laughs> Actually no one can. on this last week and the amount of websites that comes up is insane. This is of course all dependent on the data that publishing industries within those specific countries um, actually reveal. So this was according to Wildermeters and I don't think it's true. I mean look how old this data is. Spain, 2008, United Kingdom, 2005. This cannot be new data. Okay? Um, this doesn't even include self-publishing. Um, so what Alison Braverstock also says is, it's so complicated when we start looking at publishing because publishing has different formats that for years has impacted the products that we sell. She mentions the uh, I mean, I didn't even know we have all these different kinds of products. Let me just see where they are. You have the, the hard cover, the soft cover, the trade paperback, uh, the B format paperback, the ebook, the ebook without color, the ebook with color, and they're all of different ISBNs. Okay. So if you think about it like that, we're not just competing with titles, we're competing with formats in a traditional sense. Okay? So if I publish a book on uh, fly fishing and I make it only available as an ePDF, I will only be making it available to people who buy ePDFs. So people who do Kindle won't even look into it. So do you see how very quickly technology has complicated and limited the opportunity for publishers to reach a wider audience. And while publishers have been scurrying to get more formats into production. Okay. So the EPDF, there's, there's like a converted map. Yeah. So it's 
So if you have a PDF and you want to put it on your Kindle, you just click convert PDF to Mobi because that's one that's compatible. Oh, that's true. But now, how many consumers know that? Uh, a lot of them, if you. So I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> they're illegal copies, I'm joking. So, a lot of what publishers could be doing is consumer education. Um, if I take an example, um, it's an Afrikaans publisher, LAPA, and I'm talking in confidentiality in this room. So they have their uh, romance novels in one specific format. Um, and their ebooks are increasingly doing well for them, but people don't know how to purchase them. So people want them, but they don't know how to purchase them. They struggle, the Afrikaans have done this, you know, they read the love stories. They struggle to understand how to purchase an ebook online. And the fact that you then get an email with a link, yeah. and that link is linked to an app, just yeah. a, a tup with a whoosh a dip. So it's a, it's a big problem. So a lot of what publishers are doing today in terms of creating sales is not just direct marketing, but consumer education. Educating consumers on where to buy their books, because it's not just in the bookshop anymore. I want to show you a nice example, if I can get it online now. See, not penguin you. I hope um, it's still on their website. This, I mean, this is a traditional publisher. And what I like about what they've done with their website, um, I just want to see where is their purchase. Oh, Florence Welch on her debut book. That she's, a, she's a singer, hey? Yeah. Let's see, where is the story books? Oh, okay, let's go, let's go to buy the book. I just want to see if it opens it up. Yes. So look at this. Here is a title, Into the Water. And then they say, buy from. And there's a drop down menu. It's the only publisher I've ever seen to do that. So the fact that they go and they say, we don't know where people are wanting to buy this from. They made the investment to have an e-store that's white labeled, but it's not a, a commerce store. So it clicks through to one of these that is then makes it available to people. Because they said, why should we have our own store? We'll have a store that gives you the prices and gives you the blurb and all of that. But people buy from these stores. So we're just going to let them buy from them. How can we compete with Amazon's deals? How can we compete with Foils, with Watersmiths, with Waterstones, and with WH Smith? They're already there. They also made the decision to support retail. So they said, we're not going to fight against retail. Retail is everywhere in the world are struggling. These are all online. They went from brick, okay, except Amazon. Amazon was a digital retailer, but all the others were bricks and mortar retailers that went online. They're the only publisher I've ever seen to do that. And then when you, when you click through, let me just see, show you here, there you can have the different formats as well. So you can decide paperback, hardback, ebook, audio download, audio CD. As a publisher, they made the decision these are the five formats we're going to publish, these are the five retailers we're going to make it available through. I think it's very smart. It makes it very easy for people. So typically in South Africa, a South African publisher would have their formats and then say buy from Take A Lot, Loot, EB Online, what else do we have? CNA Online, do they sell books? They used to have. Do they sell? Hey? Bargain books? Bargain books? I don't know if they have an online. Hey? I don't know if they have an online. Yeah. Because we're interested and I'm using up all my data. Let's see. But you see how they've had to cater for all formats and all different people. And that's what we have to do in publishing. We cannot say, we cannot restrict ourselves to, to having a limited option for consumers. 
looks like it. No, store locate. I don't oh. think they are an online. Sign up for our newsletter. Doesn't look like it. It's only stores. That is strange. Yeah. There's an opportunity. Bing, bing, bing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the publishers who I think has one of the best online book sites is Christian Books. I don't know if you've seen the online, the e-commerce store. It's really good. And the, the, the but they went and they used Magento e-commerce software, and it's extremely intuitive. And the, the type of vouchers, freebies, newsletter info, reminders as a shopper, it's unbelievable. It's the best e-commerce site for books, I think, in South Africa. It's better than EB's, I'm sorry, but EB really has yeah, to up the ante. Hey? I've never heard of EB's. In my life. No, it is there, but it's very hard to purchase oh, from that. Okay, well, we Okay, now I want to take you to something else. South African ad spend. This is important. I hope they have it here for us. Uh, so this is Statista.com, advertising expenditures by medium, and this is for South Africa, so there's 2018. Just want to see if I have the. Uh, you have to download the full report, but there you can get it actually digital media, traditional media. Nice for your final assignment to motivate why you are using a specific type of medium. But as you can see there in 2018, for South Africa, TV still made up the largest portion of our ad spend. Then internet, which is quite astonishing. 394, that's just the index they use. So, 394 million dollars locally on the internet. Internet spend, 1.3 billion on TV. So, TV is still huge. Have we ever seen a book advertised on TV? Yeah. Who? See bookstores. Bookstores. Oh. I must say, the publishers use internet and radio a lot. We still have some of the biggest spend globally on radio. Community radio in South Africa is a big thing. So especially for emerging voices, that's very, very good. And then right at the bottom here, interestingly enough, um, video games <laughs> and cinema. I've also never seen a book advertised in a cinema. And then newspapers and magazines. I don't know what OOH is, I can't remember. Okay. Candy Crush. Do you see how low newspapers and magazines are versus the internet? Okay. So think about consumer products, things like perfume, car, groceries, um, clothes, um, school supplies, those kinds of things. Think about any consumer product. That's probably where they're advertised. The biggest spenders on TV, the health insurance industry, the insurance industry. I know, it's like, the, it's like, a, it's like a grouch purchase every month. Hey? Um, uh, cars, so the motor industry is big in South Africa. And there was one more. So health insurance, insurance, medical aid insurance, cars, and there was one more. Backs, finance. Okay. So our and then I'd say retail. So the industry is dominating in South Africa, dominating ad spend is finance and banking, insurance, whether it's medical aid or normal insurance, um, and what was the other one we said? Banking and mobility industry and retail. So retail is your normal checkers, uh, truers, etc. Okay. So those are the industries that dominate ad spend in South Africa and especially on TV. But it's good to see the rise of the internet. But if you compare it, I mean, $1.3 billion on TV 
Versus 394 million on the internet. That's the next biggest ad spend is the internet. See how big TV is in this country. Now, what would happen if Netflix really took off in South Africa? What would happen if we had free, if we had better price, I'm trying to word this right, yeah. cheaper data, and we could all afford to have Netflix at home? And it's ABC. Yeah. Yeah. They would put, then they would put adverts in front of everything like that for Facebook ads. Oh before every, awesome. before everything that you watch, yeah. you have to watch an advert. And isn't it just awful? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're going to have to pay for Atlas TV. I feel like that almost happened with Showmax, where Showmax suddenly like popped up and they're like, oh, this is going to be the competition to DSTV, and then DSTV just bought them. That's so nice, Spash, though, eh? You have to admire it. Yeah. So now you pay 99 Rand for Showmax and you get that on Netflix. And That's what I understand. And you have a subscriber to uh, you have already oh. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> yes, sir. Any thoughts? No. Uh, no. Okay. So this is important for us to, because I want you to think about the moment technology disrupts TV, there's going to be an upheaval. We saw that with all the other, I mean, look at where newspapers and magazines are. In the 80s, the biggest ads in, newspaper, in magazines were cigarette ads. They were the highest grossing ads in magazines. We don't actually see cigarette ads anymore. Have you ever, bad. when can you last recall seeing a cigarette ad? In a matric English exam. Oh, well, <laughs> like matric English exam, sure. And I mean, that's also partly due to the whole milieu of where we are. Okay? So even whether you smoke or not, I mean, that doesn't matter, but smoking is really now kind of gotten that it's dangerous, you shouldn't yeah. do it. We're also health conscious, we, we're banting, we're <laughs> omnivores, herbivores, <laughs> omnivores, I don't know what we are, we're all different things, and if we're hello, kosher, she's now, this now, everybody eats different stuff because everybody's healthy. And cigarette got kind of into that, and now nobody's advertising cigarettes. But it's still one of the biggest industries in the world. Yeah. It's such a wrong. But vapes have sort of taken over that marketing. Yes. Idea now because now it's like it and all the vape ads it's just horrible. I'm sorry, who vapes? You have to explain how. I'm just, I'm just thinking when they like blow out the smoke, they look like a dragon. There's just so much of it. I think that's the appeal. That's, but that's, that's the appeal. Vape in the mall. And I was like, excuse me, sir. There are kids around you. He's like, I'm sorry, I'm not giving away. Sorry, yes. So what kind of impact will smart TVs? It's a big problem. Let me give you a similar example. Then maybe you can give me the answer. What happens if 50% of South Africans move off the electricity grid? Escom might be able to. Yeah. Well, no, they're in a lot of things. <laughs> the problem is it's not just Escom, because a part of those fees go to municipalities. So municipalities will be making less money from power and they will have to up the cost of other services. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily agree. Tell me, Wolf. Uh, I think when you were talking about disruptors, I think one thing we missed, you mentioned technology. You didn't talk about political influence. Mm. In South Africa, we should have digitally migrated 20 years ago. Why haven't we done it? Because of political influence. Mm -hmm. You spoke about the NASPES mm. uh, buying uh, the competition. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't have happened mm. because it is anti competitive. Mm. Yeah. But yeah. William Montessa's wife, uh, daughter, is married to the uh, CEO right. oh, yeah. of NASPES. So you see, you see where the complicity comes yeah. in. That's a very good so, point. So, one of the big disruptors in South Africa is political influence. But I say this as a precursor to what I'm going to say about the energy grid. Mm. 
In, in Europe and America, it's working. Why is it working? It is working because people who go off the grid are allowed to feed back into the grid. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper for the government. The government buys cheap electricity. Mm -hmm. And they actually charge you a tax when you use back your own electricity. Mm -hmm. So it works for everybody. Mm -hmm. but it's just a different business model. Yeah, but yes. it will not work here because of the political influence they will with the company, mm. which is ESCOM. Mm. Because it will to bring them down their power. You understand? Yes. I think it's a very good so, point you make. So I don't agree with uh, the fact that it, municipalities will go down. Municipalities will make money. Yes, but we go, they can make money. They can make money. If we go off the grid. Okay. So now, your question about what happens if everyone has a smart TV. I think for that kind of expensive technology to proliferate right through to the grassroots of society, it has to be really, really cheap. But that's where you have Moore's principle. Who's heard of Moore's principle? So Moore's principle says that... Um, computing power doubles and cost decreases every, I don't know how many months. And I mean, it's been proven over and over. So, something that cost um, oh, 30,000 Rand a couple of years ago to make now costs 13,000 Rand to make. So, technology is going to become cheaper. Um, so, we'll have to see. I don't know what's going to happen to ad spend and where they're going to spend it. TV on Netflix, or is it completely no, separate? separate? But don't you think there will be a point where the critical mass of consumers is on Netflix and Sky TV will be like, eh, you're losing out? No, because Netflix doesn't show everything. Yeah, and Netflix yeah, doesn't show There's a lot that Netflix doesn't have that PSTV has. Yeah. <coughs> now. No. At the moment, they haven't bought the rights. The thing is to buy all the rights all to get the everything through Netflix. Netflix. Yeah. They yeah. don't own HBO, they don't own all the other uh, networks mm -hmm. in America. Yeah. So, I mean, you can't watch a lot of uh, things on Netflix as they come out. Like the new uh, season of Suits just started. Mm -hmm. That's not on Netflix, even though they've got the last three seasons. Mm -hmm. And that won't be on Netflix for like a year or two. That would be in line with, with DVD stores, because that's yeah. completely overwhelmed like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the council is in my blockbuster. Like they had a chance to buy Netflix, yeah, and then they declined it. They have one store left, and Netflix is like a multi-million dollar empire. I think the I think the the markets are slightly just opposed. They are not the same in the sense that uh, Sky is more live entertainment, yeah. whilst Netflix is content. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So. I want to show you this. I know it's, I know it's Kevin Spacey and everybody's probably like, who oh, has been accused of sexual assault? But can we please watch this video without giving the man a heart attack? Okay? Um, we don't have to. I know it's terrible. We, we are sensitive to the fact that he did it. But I need you to listen to what he said. Is he guilty? I don't know. Um, this was 2013 that he said this. Um, so it's really a long time ago. Really. Five years is a long time in the digital space. So this kind of set a lot of things in motion.
the success of the Netflix model, releasing the entire season of House of Cards at once proved one thing. The audience wants the control. They want the freedom. And if they want to binge, as they've been doing on House of Cards and lots of other shows, then we should let them binge. I mean, I can't tell you how many people have stopped me on the street and said, thanks, you suck three days out of my life. <laughs> and through this new form of distribution, we have demonstrated that we have learned the lesson the music industry didn't what they want, when they want it, in the form they want it in, <laughs> at a reasonable price, right. and yeah. they'll more likely pay for it as they steal it. Well, some will still steal it, but I think we can take a bite out of piracy. So I predict that in the next decade or two, any differentiation between these platforms will fall away. Is 13 hours watched as one cinematic whole really in? film as being something two hours or less, surely it, it goes deeper than that. If you're watching a film on your television, is it no longer a film because you're not watching the theater? If you watch a TV show on your iPad, is it no longer a TV show? <coughs> the device and the link are irrelevant. The labels are useless, except perhaps to agents and managers and lawyers who use these labels to conduct business deals. But for kids growing up now, there's no difference. Watching Avatar on an iPad, or watching YouTube on a TV, or watching Game of Thrones on their computer. It's all content. It's just story. And the audience has spoken. They want stories. They're dying for them. They're rooting for us to give them the right thing. And they will talk about it, binge on it, carry it with them on the bus, and to the hairdresser, force it on their friends, tweet, blog, Facebook, make fan pages, silly gifs, and God knows what else about it. Engage with it with a passion and an intimacy that a blockbuster movie could only dream of. All we have to do is give it to them. The prize fruit is right there, shinier and juicier than it's ever been before. So it will be all the more shame on each and every one of us if we don't reach out and seize it. And I want to leave you with the words of a man as good as any to address the nexus of commerce and art, Mr. Orson Welles, who once said, I hate television. I hate it as much as peanuts. But I just can't stop eating peanuts. Thank you. It's a very, very good video. Uh, that talks about the fact that that's what publishers should be doing, in my opinion is selling content. And how we sell content, when we sell content, in what format we sell content, how do we define a book? What is a book? It's the same with the movies. Is it 250 pages, 60,000 words? In the old days we used to have monographs, you remember those? Novels, novelettes, short stories, compilations. So we have to really rethink about how we sell content, what kind of content, and how we market that content. And I mean, I'm probably talking more into publishing management now and commissioning, but it is something to keep in mind when we market. And when you go to a publisher one day who's published a brilliant book that is 275 pages, and you are trying to convince them to make the chapters available as iTunes downloads, you might need this argument. Okay. Holding thumbs. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so again, on still on page four. Sorry, this is one quote in paragraph. Uh, the th second paragraph from the bottom. I want to read to you. Effective marketing depends on a deep understanding of the chosen market and product within the context of contemporary society and the available resources. And effective management of trends tends, and effective management of marketing tends to emerge through detailed research and planning rather than formulaic application of rules. So, given everything that's going on, you cannot market with a shotgun approach. You cannot go and say, and 30 bullets are out, and you say, we hope for the best. That doesn't work. There has to be a plan. And there has to be a plan, because as diverse as our consumers are, not just in terms of their needs, but in where they find themselves, 
We could be marketing on all of those platforms, in all of those channels, in all of those formats, but your budget probably won't allow it. So planning and good research is necessary. A good understanding of who the, who the, who the audience is and what we're trying to sell to them. Okay. Remember too that effective marketing planning is vital in inquiring as well as selling publishing content. So in the old days, um, we well globally, they, the, um, the commissioning editors buy content from agents. We don't have a culture of agents in South Africa. There are one or two companies in, in the publish uh, SA uh, catalogue that are agents for authors. It's just not something that's popular. We don't have a big enough publishing market for agents to make a living. We do have development editors that do quite well, and they will often help an author to get into a publishing house. But it's not a buyout, it's not an agency type of model. Okay. Then on page five, there is a grey block that talks about the Apple marketing philosophy. Now, who knows anything about the Apple marketing philosophy? Who's rich out to one? <laughs> Who has purchased Apple products? Okay. Why have you purchased those products? Um, they, all the devices link together easily, so it makes it actually easier to do anything. Okay. Um, so it's uh, keep it simple. Kiss, chaos, simple. It all talks to each other. Your life is easier. Hey. Interoperability. Yeah. Lovely, Wilson. Who else? Yes? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, because you see other people have Apple. Yes. It's a, it's a status thing, it's a class thing. If yeah. you have an Apple device, it's like, oh, you have Apple. Yes. So that's yeah. what made your reasoning behind getting. I agree. I have an Apple iPhone, and then if I compare it to a Huawei or a Samsung, I think it's oh, just as pretty. I don't know what it is about the Apple. Yeah, it's just... There's a something there. Why did you buy an Apple? It looks good. <laughs> it does. I must show you. I got a new one. Look at this. Look at this pretty oh, thing. Yes, oh. Yes, yes. This is a new MacBook Pro. It's like you want to lick it. It's just so pretty. Okay? Yes, I know. <coughs> I'm, I'm, so that one I have to use exclusively for work, so I still have to use the little, little red one for other stuff. But um, that, that, um, that grey block. The Apple marketing philosophy stressed three points. Um, the first was empathy. Now that's a very interesting marketing strategy for a company to have. An intimate connection with the feelings of the customer. We will truly understand their needs better than any other company. Now, let's pause for a moment there. Someone living in poverty who cannot afford an apple. I mean, they, how can they say they have empathy with customers? They clearly are creating products for all customers. They are creating products for a specific customer. So that empathy, we will truly understand their needs better than any other company. I think what they did, and we can discuss this, is they said, and I mean this is very much Steve Jobs' philosophy, they will make pretty things, functional things, and people will want it. And I think the empathy is perhaps in the, what they are building now. Um, I mean, how many changes are there when an operating system on iOS upgrades? It's not a lot, but it's, it's small little things. So it's interesting that they have empathy as this thing, because I think, although they listen to customers, um, they, they have a very clear um, design aesthetic, product aesthetic. Um, yeah, I don't know what it is. Empathy for me, I hear what they say, but empathy is almost too big a term for it. Yeah, I about them saying they have empathy because they were fined for purposefully slowing down phones <laughs> every update. True. To force you to buy a new phone. Them, yeah, True. Yeah. Empathy is a strong word for me. What yeah. I do, what I will say is, we will truly understand their needs better than any other company. I think that is probably true. Yeah. 
But I think they got this right at launch. The first time an iPod was launched, and everyone went like, what? Who wanted to have that little thing with music on? Never, ever, ever. And then it was just so pretty. And the colours were pretty. And then you saw people running around the gym, you're like, I want one. Okay, so they had a very clear aesthetic. Yes, Wilson. I think um, I understand that. I mean, that's 25 pound rand. That is a, that's a lot of money. So it's expensive product and still they, they do well. Because I would say, and I mean they didn't put it in here, but I would say there's a lot of aspirational value in their product. Yeah. Aspirational. <coughs> you aspire to that. So if you don't have an iPhone or an Apple anything, it is something to aspire to, whether it's status or because it's pretty or because it puts you in a different social class or, I don't know, there's a, and I mean aspiration alone as a, as a value in marketing could be two things. Because if you look like, if you look for example at a, uh, an NGO company who creates jobs for the youth who have not been able to get um, university, um, what do you call it? University <coughs> exemption? Yeah. Yeah. What's it called? Yeah. Freistelling in, in English? Entrance. Entrance. So you can't get university entrance. So that's an NGO. They also have an aspirational value because they are trying to help young people to be aspire to be better. So the products and services they sell is be better, aspire to better. Whereas iPhone or Apple's marketing value as an aspirational product is I want to own that. Yeah, I okay? think maybe then I think they use the word empathy as in under as in a way to say understanding, yes. a psychological and emotional understanding of the yeah, customer. Because so it's not yeah, it's not about can you afford it. It's about how can you make you want it, and that you will pay twenty five thousand rand for this laptop instead of. 10,000 rand for the other right. one. Right. How, can we, how can we understand you so that you can afford it? Mm. <laughs> how can we make you, make you afford it? What are we going to do to make you want to afford it? Yeah, I think it's true. Because they're still doing very well. Very, very good point. The second was focus. In order to do a, a good job of those things that we decide to do, we must eliminate all of the unimportant opportunities. I think that is a lot to do with their, with their design. So they said, um, when we market, we have a clear message. I mean, how, how, when was the last time you saw actually any Apple product being marketed? Just when they launch, basically. Yeah, just the launch. They do a the launch, and then they leave it to yeah. the community. Because I mean, I can't remember, uh, right at the start with the iPods, I remember there being lots of ads on iPods mm. and use of iPods, and it was just great. Yeah. The tiny little iPods. Well, it was first a big one, I can't remember. One of them. It was yeah, a big was that, first. It was a big yeah, one, and, and it got smaller and it got bigger. You could get, yeah, the shuffle was that it and only had like 100 songs, but that was tiny, and then you flip onto your. Yeah. But it's more like consumer generated content because it's almost like, as of us consumers, hype up. Yeah, right. almost like word of Because every time I saw the new Apple's about to launch, that's it. That's yeah. September, that should be launched. I don't have to have any ad on TV yeah. radio anyway. Maybe on, uh, when you open your iTunes, it'll be an ad that says, yeah. remember, we're launching. But that's it. They don't actually market to end consumers anymore. I think right. it's, there's this assumption that every version of technology is better than the last. But if and that's why people go and, and yeah. buy the new iPhone 7, even though it doesn't have an iPhone, okay. like a jack. Oh, but wireless headphones must be better. 
So now if we compare their marketing to Coca-Cola, considering I showed you Coca-Cola's content 2020 strategy, Coke still markets, we still see yeah. clink, 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 if you hear that sound, you're first to immediately. And they're trying to stay relatable, I think, to consumer Coke, is they like a company for the people. Oh, um, Apple. Yeah. I think, um, Whereas Apple's are trying to be us. You see, Apple sells to a certain type of uh, generation. Mm. Do you not know, sell it to kids? Coca-Cola, even babies in diapers want to drink Coca-Cola. because True. But my daughter is 11 and she wants an apple. She wants a MacBook. She doesn't want an image brain. <laughs> She's 11. It's typo. There's typo images where you see that. It's kind of like um, there's like luxury car brands that don't advertise. Because a few years ago I realized I was like Lexus doesn't actually advertise. But it's like they, they know that you're going to go to them if you want a Lexus. It's not just like, oh, should I get a Lexus? You're going to go get it. You're going to go get it. Like their marketing is no advertising. Is it, yeah. is it like. Um, I think that's a good point. Their yeah. marketing is no advertising. They've reached a brand point where they know exactly who their the consumers are and they will probably do direct marketing and resell. So once you've bought an excess, they'll keep you in that value chain. So the after sales experience is probably where they invest right. their money yeah. and customer retention, mm -hmm. we'll talk about customer that, retention. versus getting new customers. Because they'll probably be thinking, if you drive a Lexus for life, your six year old's gonna want to drive a Lexus for life. So they're probably bigger on customer retention than acquiring new customers. Just there okay. and then back here. Sure. Um, I'm like, I can't tell you about Lexus because I don't drive a Lexus, but um, me, my family, my boyfriend's family, we all drive Altimus, mm -hmm. okay? And they very much like to keep things in their family. So if you bought one of the more top of the range mm -hmm. uh, Alphas, so like a 4C or Sports mm -hmm. or something like that, they will invite you to a track day. You can come bring your car and drive on a track and race each other. Okay. okay. This is not advertised on social media. They no. don't email them to their Direct audience. marketing. And they contact their clients directly that they want to have these events because they know, oh, this family, they bought four cars from us. We treat them like royalty, mm -hmm. they'll keep coming back. I mean, Coke can't do that to every person who buys a Coke. No, I <laughs> <laughs> Apple, Apple might try to do that to every person who buys an Apple, but I mean, clearly for luxury brands, it's definitely mm -hmm. doable. Direct but it's a different market. I mean, yeah. you don't see an advert when a new Ferrari comes out. No. This is true, yeah. They don't yeah. need to market so it. So that was my Ferrari, question. You walk into Ferrari and you buy Observing them. that, is it safe to say that marketing and advertising are not the same? Definitely not. Mm. I don't think so because I think advertising is probably more to do. <sighs> I would think advertising is more to do with a medium. Mm. Yes, there's a message, but I think it's the marketing team who has determined that. Very much with branding, because branding is now almost more important mm -hmm. than marketing in most corporate companies. We don't have that kind of culture in publishing, because we've never sold our brand. You sold the author's brand. Yeah. So in, in a company like Lexus, you would have your brand manager, CI, brand CIO, CMO, with marketing reporting into him. Whereas publishing, we don't have that. And in advertising is almost like the spin on it. It is the medium. Because okay. you get above the line, below the line. So branding determines the brand values, the brand message. And then they will say, how do we market? And market includes customer retention, direct marketing, events, PR, etc. And advertising includes your multimedia formats. Oh. That's how I would see the differentiation. Okay. So advertising is very much, so um, uh, events would not fall in advertising, would fall in marketing. Okay. Yeah, because there's, there's very much a spend connected to advertising. Okay, sorry, we just have to go on. And then the third one, they say there, um, the third and equally important principle, awkwardly named, was <coughs> impute. That was quite kind of nice. Um, it is emphasized that people form an opinion about a company or product based on the signals that it conveys. 
People do judge a book by its cover, so apt that he uses that. We may have the best product, the highest quality, the most useful software. If we present them in a slipshod manner, they will be perceived as slipshod. If we present them in a creative, professional manner, we will impute the desired qualities. That is so nicely put, I feel like Mufasa. <laughs> impute the qualities, the desired qualities. Please quote that in your assignment somewhere. <laughs> if we want to impute the desired qualities of a brand, of a product, of a service, How we do that? Yeah, that's my question. Because yeah. those qualities seem to be intangible. Right. Yes and no. Okay. Let's take an example of, um, of, a, of a writer. I mean, let's take a really simple example. Excuse me. Let's take Stephanie Meyer and Twine. <laughs> she, I mean, what kind of qualities is there in that book? It's, um, it, it's almost like putting your unique selling points up and saying these are the unique selling points of this product. But instead of pushing the unique selling points, we are going to impute the, the qualities that is inherent in that product. When you read this, when you consume this, you will feel this. That's branding. Branding is all about what we feel about a, a specific product or service. Uh, or you will experience this. So, because when we when you have an apple, it's not just an apple, it's an experience to have an apple. Mm -hmm. And an apple looks good. When we market John Grisham's new book, we're not going to market John Grisham in Chinatown. We're going to market him at Hyde Park, probably. So, connecting the values of the brand, product, service that we want to market, conveying that in the right way, so that the consumers buy what we want them to buy, Okay, let's read more about that. Okay, so we have a little time left. The meaning of marketing. Um, two things that I just want to say. The Kotler definition is almost too difficult for me. It's very business orientated. I actually like the one that Stokes and Lomax did on page 5. The reason for this diversity of meaning is that marketing is both a management philosophy and a function in the organization. So it's a philosophy. It's how we push our product to market. But it's also a function. Function meaning that there are certain things that need to be done. So when you um, look at general business management theory, marketing is one of the functions in ops management. Op, uh, ops, marketing, finance, HR. It's a function of business, but there's also a philosophy behind it. And when we look at the philosophy, that's when we start looking at things like the brand, the values, the message, the the soft stuff, the stuff that we feel in here. Okay. When we look at market research next time, I've got a really nice presentation that shows you when do we feel stuff for a brand and when do we just experience the brand, just want to uh, trade money for it. Okay, so we'll look at that next time. So, any nice definitions from your side? Any takers? <coughs> Wilson, did you write a definition of marketing? No, but I read it. Okay, can you read it to us? I almost gave up when I realized that there uh, were about 75 different... <laughs> <laughs> yes, there That's are many, <laughs> many definitions on marketing. Um, I think it's a process of... Uh, what do you call it? Ad advertising and selling um, goods and services. Uh, That's what I thought. But I've learned a lot from this. <laughs> so it says the process of advertising and selling goods and services. Mm -hmm. I like the process because that speaks to the management function. Mm -hmm. But there's something, just an add on to the warm and fuzzies. Yes. <laughs> um, I found that was somewhat over. Yeah? Marketing can be boiled down to education. Effectively educating people about any good product will create the desire needed to produce action. Mm. I like that. Okay. Uh, just say the last bit to create uh, to create a desire. To create the desire needed to produce action. To 
create a desire needed to produce action, and that action is the ad purchasing action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To create a desire to produce action. I like that. Yeah. I like that. There's a bit more of the woman fuzzies in there, Wilson. <laughs> You don't have to buy them. It's creating an action where you go and you do charity work, you become involved in something, and that's creating the action. And it's not necessarily the, the, the buying of something. Okay. Um, and I think that's a nice example because people now listen to the, the marketing on the radio, they go, I want in on this. They go, they download the app. They start doing the things that help get them right, points, and now they, yeah. and then they can get the tickets. Wow, okay. Okay. I agree, Michelle. I just had one that um, it's the process through which business services move from concept to the customer. So I like the from concept mm -hmm. part. That, that does include a bit of R and D, so research and development, and then and then final product. Yeah. Uh, which is also good because the marketing is very much involved in R and D of new products and services. And depending on yes. like customer needs and so if, and if you if you take out the concept and R and D part and you say that it's only getting the product to them, then you're taking out the whole part of is it something that they actually want? Mm, and no matter what true. marketing we do, will it lead to the action of buying or of going out to go do the Charity work for. Yeah. So we, it's a process. It has to create a desired action with our customers. Um, it involves understanding the market prior to giving them something. So the research part, yes? Um, first, I'll just say my definition and then I think yeah. there's just something that I want to say about that. But I kind of took a step back to say, okay, marketing, market. So basically, So I like yours, the sustain, the ongoing, okay? And also just kind of thinking about this topic, um, marketing, and kind of understanding your market. I've always had a problem with um, articles and speakers and whatever who are always carrying on about township marketing. Yes. So, oh <laughs> I have so much to say about that that I probably shouldn't say anything, but it's, 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 yeah. You know what I'm going to tell you? <laughs> You're going to laugh. In, when I was um, in my prilly year, when I was young and beautiful, I did a media management program at Stellenbosch University through Nascash, because I was working in Nascash. And we had to do a group assignment, and our group got an assignment on township marketing. Mm. So, after eight months of researching this as seven people, we came back and we said, um, this is not something that exists as a as something that you should target. You can't 
You can't make a team of people to say, target township marketing. Um, and we got very low marks <laughs> for our assignment. <laughs> and so I know exactly what you're talking about. Because we reached just all of it and then we realized you can't put it down to one thing. And uh, and to and that special wanted to know, um, so I wanted like a strategy for it. <laughs> and we said, we're sorry, we, we've done eight months of research. Yeah. And we honestly cannot give you a strategy because at that time, this was 2004. The type of research that was available really was terrible. And it was, I'm going to say, all written by white people's perspectives. I'm sorry, on township living. So then we said, there's no, nothing we can give them. So we've got very low marks. <laughs> <laughs> so, you get like suburbia I know. <laughs> but you know what? And look, I'm, just, I'm saying with lots of respect. But what NASPAT has done very well is to, for example, understand the Afrikaans market somehow. That's why they have VRT affair, but they, that's what their employees look like, I'm going to be honest. So they, they have that understanding and it comes easy for them. But um, yeah, so 2004 I was quite unpopular. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got process, get them to do an action, understand them, research them, keep it going. That's basically what we're taking away from this. Anybody else? Can I ask a question? Yes, please. <clears throat> Let me tell you. <laughs> I'm going to be the, what I'm what I'm getting at now because we have all the fluffy stuff. Is at the end of the day, we are still driven by profit. So if marketing doesn't show some kind of a return on investment, and that return on investment doesn't have to be financial. It could be a social, S-R-O-I, social return on investment. And um, social return on investment is quite a big thing now in South Africa. Then it's also fine. Marketing always gets probably one of the biggest budgets in any company. And people are always angry at marketing for getting more money. But the point of marketing is to make more money. The sales team are at the at the coal face of that, whether it's a face-to-face -face sales team or whether you're selling air conditioners door-to-door -door or whether you have account managers for big companies, sales people are at the coal face, but the marketing team, and marketing includes your branding, branding includes marketing, they have to make the message. They have to understand the people and make the message. Somehow I think Enduring purpose is imaging and branding. Mm. Because Coca Cola, they don't have to advertise. No. But they want that brand to be there in your face. True. But I mean, if you think of any popular brand, we just see the image and we know who they are. Right. I mean, we, you see that little apple and you know who it is. Mm. You see the Nike Swish and you know who it is. You see Google's G and you know who it is. You see Facebook, you know who it is. Can any of you immediately think of any publisher's brand as an image? Penguin. It's not a letter, it's a pakawai. <laughs> How effective is that? Mm. So maybe we should have more publishers that have animals as brands. Well, they, they, <laughs> Strike they has the blue crane. There was a, yeah, oh, yeah. a, there was a, um, when I worked for the magazine, they found that um, magazine covers with something like a face and eyes sold better than something like a building for kids. Okay. So maybe it's this thing about having an association with something that's as alive as you are, yeah. maybe. So the penguin is like cute and you remember it, but I mean... A letter. <coughs> that's not. There's nothing there. There's nothing there's associated no connection. there. There's no. Yeah. There's no connection. But you think of penguin. You think of, oh, cute little penguins. Or you think of a bird. And you think of the. You know. Oh, I hate birds. But I'm trying you know, to think of any other publisher whose whose brand image I can immediately think of. I'm like stumped. Good question. I don't know any of these. 
best feed I get now. The brand is publisher. Oh, look at that. The brand is publisher. This is just everywhere. Seven reasons why top brands are, for, are thinking like publishers. This is like the topic of the day, people. Okay, now we're going to have to look at that. Let's just say so publisher. The definition brands. of marketing that we ran through, could you say that again? So we've said, just from these four definitions we got, we've said it's a process. It has to create an action with our customers. It has to get them to do something. It involves understanding the market. And it has to be sustainable. And I want to add sustainable beyond the act of what we got them to do. Whatever that act is. So sustainable beyond? Beyond that act that we got them to do. So we actually came up with a nice definition ourselves. Huh? We are the new marketing Harvard Business Review from Cambia. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to have to look at, at, at publisher brands a bit. Maybe next time. What's our lesson next time? I can't remember. Okay, I'm going to stop there for tonight. Uh, I do want to ask you, please continue reading um, the rest of chapter one. Uh, they have checklists for achieving good marketing with the seven R's for marketing. Those are the R's for marketing, not for publishing. But please be aware of right people, right product, right price, right promotional approach, the right way, the right time, the right place. Very importantly, at the end of chapter one, there's a small little um, paragraph on page 18 that gives a definition about relationship marketing. And which nowadays referred to as CRM, Customer Relationship Management. So please understand CRM and just that little paragraph is a nice introduction to it. Because we're going to be doing a lot more on relationship marketing. Okay. And relationship marketing has everything to do with the sustainability. So the promotion of customer satisfaction and hence retention. Customer retention. Okay. And you can just imagine how important customer retention is for a publisher. Okay. And then for next week, please read chapters 2 and 3 as well, if you can. That would be really nice. And then just as a last request, so that I can send it out to everybody, I think it would be nice. If everyone can email me their definitions of, of marketing with the reference of where you've got that. And I'm going to start a little document for us with everybody's collective thoughts. I think that would be nice. Okay. Like that you can create your own one. Okay, yeah. Then you say copyright, Mr. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Creative Commons license, please, so that I can copy it. And please read uh, chapters two and three. There's no prep for next week. Just please be ready with chapters.